are so excited to have you here today for our third forum on Guiding Catholic, where we're going to be talking about solutions. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, Tanisha Maxwell, and Vice President of Student Affairs. I am Chaplain Counseling Faculty. So Diane and I are um, tri-chairs along with our interim instructional dean, Dr. Doug Berry, who is uh, otherwise occupied with go, no, go meetings all day. So we, we are going to continue to facilitate along with the forum today and let you know what you can expect. We may shift you all around because we want to make sure that we have at least uh, two people at each of the five tables and we'll explain a little bit more about one. Okay? So general overview of what we're going to be doing today. We're going to just give a, a recap of what Guided Pathways is, why it's important, and then talk about a few of the goals, and then also review a little bit about what the um, first and second forums were about. You'll find on your tables, and I'll orient you to the things that you have on your tables and the handout. This is just to give you more information about Guided Pathways and what we've been doing on campus so far in terms of awareness campaigns and sense me. And then we're going to give you an opportunity to work at your tables and discuss solutions as a result of the context that we give you around what Guided Pathways is and what some of the outcomes have been from the previous forums that we've had. Please come on in. And then we'll have you all report out and we're going to also discuss the frequently asked questions handout that we had on the table. So let me just give you a little bit of an orientation on all the paperwork that's on your table, okay? So the first thing that I'm going to point out to you are these two pieces of paper, the, the two outlines. These are basically the outcomes from the first two forums that we have. You see one in bold caps, uh, you, your eye will probably go to it, says barriers, and one in bold caps says opportunities. So this is a result of the roundtable discussions and the summary of feedback that we received from the first two sessions as we talked about guided pathways and then what the themes were related to each one of the uh, particular phases of the student life cycle, which is why we have you sitting in these five sections today because we still want to talk about this in the context of the, from the pathway of the student life cycle, okay? So you are going to use these as a resource today, and then you're welcome to take them home with you, okay? The other thing that we have at the tables is our elevator speech. So our college implementation team came up with this elevator speech to be able to have a common language around how we wanted to talk about guided pathways and what does that mean to us. And so please feel free to utilize this language. It gives you the themes of what uh, our guided pathways means and then uh, on the bottom it gives you information about who the members are of the guided pathways college implementation team locally here then on the back side of this what you'll find is the infographic that's related to guided pathways and the framework that we're following um, as adopted by the American Association of Community Colleges so on the left on my left the um, green side that says implementation, this gives you an overall view of what Guided Pathways is about and what, is the, what we are trying to accomplish. So we want to be able to clarify a path for students, help students um, get on a path, stay on a path, and ensure that they're learning. So underneath each one of these, it gives little bullet points of, of what, what each one of these areas entail in terms of implementation. So um, this comprehensively is a great infographic to give you information about guided pathways. So we try to hand this out at each forum. These will also be available as well as the convocation tomorrow. Okay, so that gives you some more information about guided pathways. Then the final thing that you have at your table that I want to make sure that we orient you to is this FAQ document. So this document was uh, given to the chairs of the Guided Pathways teams across the different uh, colleges, district-wide. Come on up, have a seat right here. And um, the business leads put this together. And so we are going to spend some time before we finish our session today going over this document of frequently asked questions. 
to give you some more context about guided pathways as well. Okay, so all of the documents that are there on your table, you're more than welcome to take home with you. The blue sheets are there for you to provide feedback as well about the session today. So, yeah, sure, I can do that. So, uh, with the frequently asked questions document, I'm just going to avert your attention to the project area graphic that's there on that next very first page. And um, it's up here, but it is hard to see. This is essentially the model or, that we started with when trying to identify what guided pathways was about and how we were going to be implementing this in, at a system level. So in the center there, what you find is that those are the four main project areas that um, we felt have had the, will have the most work required as it relates to guided pathways. So integrated student support really focuses on aspects of what we do for onboarding our students, recruiting our students, and the ongoing support that we provide to students. Not only in student affairs, but learning support, other areas of the college as well, and what is the student experience throughout the time that they're here. Um, the broadly related areas of study and institutes really focuses on the, that concept of the larger majors that our students will identify. So I think about it in the sense of a cluster, and then within that cluster there are these pathways that students can follow. The best example that I can give is business. So business might be a general cluster, and within business there are these pathways that students might follow that really become their major, such as management or economics or finance, okay? So when students are looking for a way to um, know how to get from the beginning of their educational plan and goals through the end, it's important to be able to help them identify how they're going to get there. And it's important for us to be able to advertise and market to the students so that they know that and that our employees know that as well. That also will have uh, some level of connection with industry partnerships and what's in demand in terms of careers. And so we want to make sure that we're also aware of that in terms of how we are starting to organize and focus what it is that we're offering to our students. And it doesn't mean that we're doing something different, it just means we want to streamline what it is that we have and put it together in a package that is, that is something that's more digestible for our students. Uh, another is the, the pathway mapping. So the pathway mapping piece of it really focuses more on um, ways that students can identify what sequence of courses they're going to be taking once they're on a path, right? So it could be that if, if we organize that by semester. So if a student was majoring in nursing, per se, this is what happens in the first block and we map that path all the way out until they're completed, right? So that gives you an idea of the, the complexity of that. And that could include general education courses as well as maybe discipline-specific courses that a student would need to take or an internship course that they may need to take as part of that path and where that goal is going to lead them into the workforce or maybe even to another institution. And then the integrated developmental education really has a lot of connection with the integrated student support because it's a part of that onboarding process as well. Students are testing into developmental education courses. How do we learn about the high stakes of those tasks? How do we identify ways in which we can offer different formats that help them move through those, um, those pieces of where they might need um, a, a bit of um, review so that they can move into college level courses. So each one of these areas are very important components of guided pathways, but they also all have some level of overlap in terms of how we support our students from a system-wide perspective. And then on the outside circle of that are some of those other components that will also have an impact. So an example that I like to use is with the integrated support project area. You see there, there's professional development, budget, and finance, and technology. And the example I like to use is advisement. Advisement is going to be a very large part of uh, and what decisions we make around advisement will be a very large part of how well we can implement guided pathways. There are going to need to be some level of uh, professional development for our current advisors. Um, we may need to hire other advisors, which might get into a little bit of the human resources component and how we look at how we um, identify what our advisor's role is on campus and how we support students. 
It could also be that the e-tools that we use are connected to advisement or other service support, or even faculty and early alert and other components that are going to help students get through that process. So that just kind of lets you know, and budget and finance, right? So we won't be able to do any of this without being able to leverage some of those resources around how we make those decisions. So in, in, even though this is kind of a very simple graphic, there's quite a bit to the information that we actually um, are looking at in terms of a framework for guided pathways and what it means for us as a system. Okay. And I think that that inner circle <clears throat> with those arrows that are going around just um, shows that this is going to involve more integration between sides of the house, between student affairs and academic affairs. It's not going to be as delineated or as much in silos. Getting back to the advising example, advisors may be the one that onboards you in the beginning, but they would do the soft handoff to whatever department or program that you're going to be on, so that that then that um, the program then or the um, faculty, whoever's been designated as as uh, doing this, can help the students continue to on their path with input from them on what is best for them on their path. So uh, and uh, the Delta Dev Ed component. You know, there isn't a part of education that doesn't factor in to developmental ed. So that's going to be a big thing that's going to be looked at in terms of how we do that. Because even in our uh, classes that don't require a placement test score, our psych classes, et cetera, you know, being able to read that at college level and a critical thinking level is very important. So that's, all these things are related and still <coughs> occupy their own space, but there's going to be more intertwined things going on now between academic affairs and uh, uh, student affairs. And, and as well as administrative services too. Yeah. And so at, at the beginning when we first started hearing about transformation, we heard about these four pillars, right? There were four pillars that started out with enterprise performance, guided pathways, um, the industry partnerships, and, I'm, and, and integrated student support. But now you start to see those things are more integrated. Integrated student support actually got integrated into guided pathways. The industry partnerships is, is connected, but still not fully integrated yet. But I think eventually it will be once they really start to set the course of how they want to be able to uh, define industry partnerships and what that means for an institute model and also more majors. So those things start to come together and the enterprise um, performance is still uh, somewhat connected, but loosely in the, in the same sense, but focuses a lot on talent management, how we hire, what the job descriptions are, marketing pieces and components, et cetera. So, and budget. So those things are also still very much connected, but just not necessarily as integrated right now. So that's also important. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, just to get a framework. Are we doing guided pathways as an institution or as a district? And I'm just trying to get my head around is like, are we deciding here as CD or district or how does that work? I mean, it's both. Okay. It is both, but I would say that the weight is at the system level, right? And the system level decisions about guided pathways, they are soliciting input from every college. And as part of that process, there are gonna be things that we need to understand from a cultural resource student need perspective at the college level, what's gonna be the best way to implement guided pathways. But there's going to be some overarching guidelines from the system level to standardize the way in which we do that. So there has to be some things that are shared or similar between colleges because we have students who wanna take some classes at Scottsdale and some here. I mean, each college has its own specialty area or certain programs, so those are, those will be ours. Um, there's going to be input every step of the way. I think there's this fear that somebody at district is going to make a decision on how we're going to do, people get stuck on the guided pathway, or the pathway mapping part of this. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it can't be that way. Um, it's like Tanisha said, we all have our own culture and our way of doing things, so it'll be, system-wide, but it'll have its tweaks that are PDCD-centric based on how we are, but it still has to fit within the network. So it's still a work in progress. We don't know what, I mean, we're, we're part of that development? Yes. yes. Okay. It is a work in progress. Okay. So 
So what 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 is what what train has left the station is that we will be doing guided pathways. What that actually looks like in terms of implementation at a system level is um, is the work in progress. Okay. Because we want to solicit all the subject matter experts. We want to solicit everyone's input in that process as we're developing that and as we go. You know, um, at the end of our last session. Somebody asked me a question as I was leaving because I think the perception is is that we're much further down this road than we actually are in the industry. And so there was fear, and of course, that's the perspective here at the very, very end, um, that paths were already determined, somebody's making that decision, and, and it's, it's nowhere close to that yet. This is still pouring the foundation if you want to look at it in those terms. So it's how the, the district committee is coming together, how the um, individual college committees are gelling, and then, uh, because marketing hasn't even happened yet. You know, there's so many components to this that, so it is ground level, so nothing has been, you can't say this is what the mapping process is yet, or what the maps are, because that hasn't been decided yet. And, well, I'll, I'll get to it in a little bit when you talk about transparency. Yeah. So, and these are our general work team. And so there's themes around these work teams, and these work teams are still being developed because the components of being able to, um, they're creating the scope documents that are driving what the focus is going to be for each of these work teams and what are the priorities within the work team. So an example would be for integrated student support, one of the priorities focuses on advisory. So there's some scope documents that right now are being developed and going through a vetting process as it relates to what are the priorities around advisement that we need to make sure that we have work teams around to, to um, get the work completed that needs to be done to get to the point of implementing guided pathways so that we can prepare ourselves as a system to do that. And so the, the themes might be around professional development or how many advisors do we hire and what's the sustainability of that and how we have work teams to around that to see what's going to be a good fit for our system. Great question. Okay, so <clears throat> when you think about guided pathways, like you said, everybody everybody gets uh, immediately goes to pathway mapping, but there's a whole thought process and, and um, system around it. And so guided pathways, in general, starts with what they say, starts with the end in mind. And the end in mind is, where do my students want to go? So when they come here, they have uh, a lot of questions, a lot of trepidation, um, they, they have things they want to accomplish. And so <clears throat> we are looking at this as, here's where they want to go, what's the best way to get them there? What are the steps that make that process easiest for them, costs the least amount of money, and has the least amount of time in terms of semesters or years where they are spent doing this? So um, we've all seen the, the data at different convocations of completion rates and things like that at this college and across the district. And so the district was compelled, and I, and I understand that, that this is something they need to look at. Because if you have enrollment that's down, generally speaking, and completion rates that aren't looking that great, then to not do something about it is you know, the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting good results. So, um, the district or the Maricopa had to look at this. You have to. And things have to change based on what kind of students we have coming in, what the market bears, um, how our students change in, in what they kind of tools they want to use, things like that. So um, this is why our business partners are highly involved in this also, is because they are providing us with here's what we need, here's the kind of training we want our students to have. And so these are some of the things that, that they can help us help determine what some of these pathways may look like. Because our goal, and for most students, I don't know any uh, phase three who aren't this way, but eventually they want to get hired and they want to be working within a certain field. So if we get this input, um, this, is, this is going to help us. And then equity in these outcomes. Uh, kind of pathways makes it a little, a little bit simpler for Students who are coming from a challenging background, socioeconomic concerns, busy lives, things like that, 
It helps them streamline the onboarding process and then find what they are trying to achieve and then get there in a time that is um, that evens the playing field in terms of this is available for everyone. <coughs> so there's a few things that have to happen in this process, and this is why you're getting uh, emails every two weeks, and um, is because there needs to be collaboration. Obviously, there's going to be collaboration across disciplines. There's going to be collaboration across colleges, from administration on down. And so uh, this is why we do the forums, because we need faculty engagement, faculty and staff engagement. Everybody's voices matter in this situation. And so um, uh, it's, it's key to have relational trust between administration, faculty, and staff. And this can be a tricky area sometimes where administration says one thing, and that's not what's me. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then it turns out to be a different reality. So um, this is why, from the president on down, the people at every level are involved in this process, and they're bringing in everybody else from both sides, the academic and student affairs side of the house, so that we can see what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, basically. And when I said this is basically pouring the foundation, it literally is. I mean, there, there isn't some secret room happening somewhere else. It is, it is starting at the top, and we are t deciding as we're going, what is going to work best for us and our district and our college. The transparency part, like I said, this is why we're sending the emails. I'll be showing you something at the end, which also is part of the transparency part of it. Uh, there's no hidden agenda, there can't be, or this can never work. There's no hidden agenda, there's nothing going on in dark rooms somewhere. Um, we, we, have, we send out emails that talk about, after every co-chair meeting, it's like, here's what we did. So that kind of transparency can kind of can make some of the fear or the distrust go down a little bit. There's going to be cross-functional uh, cross teams, and that part I think is pretty exciting because um, when you think about people in different divisions, you're going to have to have teams that are, that are able to work together. Um, math, for example, there isn't a, there are very few disciplines that isn't going to involve some kind of math. So math and whoever the other discipline is has to be able to work together. Here's how math is going to work. Business already does that, but there are other departments in terms of what do you want in terms of your uh, reading skills and your critical reading skills, along with the math type of thing. And so this kind of cross-functional uh, collaboration starts to develop trust, that I know that the English department is, is as committed to making these paths, or maps the best possible, just like I know the psych department is. And so these kind of things break down some of the silos. Um, current data to transform, uh, making use of data to transform current practices. This whole system is based on data. The whole reason why we're doing this is because of research that has been done the book that was written, yeah, Redesigning America's Community Colleges. If anybody wants to borrow my copy, it's in my office. Um, it's scintillating reading. Uh, actually, it, actually it, is, it is kind of interesting. Um, and then ongoing communication. So you're going to be continue to be um, transfixed by our, our communication as we move through this process. All right, so what makes Guided Pathways different? <clears throat> well, what Guided Pathways essentially is, and this is system-wide, and that's why it's called transformative, but it's going to be a framework that brings together existing effective approaches already in place. I think there's this fear that we're gonna burn the house down and then build from there, and that is not how this is going to be. Um, like Dr. Dale likes to say, we've already, we're already a certain way down this road. Um, this isn't scorched earth, this is, we're building on programs that we already have. And so there are some divisions that have really excellent ones. There are very little thing, very little is going to change for them because they've kind of figured it out. And so uh, we're going to just build on stuff because PBCC already does a lot of things that are incredibly um, uh, useful. And so there's no reason to not continue to build on it. The big thing promotes student equity and completion. This is where that we're looking to have every 
various students experience be good and that they are able to move through the different parts of PVCC with having systems and structures in place, people in place. There's always going to be somebody there that's going to be like, oh yeah, I can tell you the next step to do. And these are the kind of things that, that students are saying that they want. We had a person in our last session who said, well, don't students use something about using um, college resources, but any of us who teach first semester freshmen, for sure, know that, yes, we have tons of college resources here. They just don't know about them, and even if they've heard about them in new student orientation, even if in the college success classes, I've had a parade of people coming through my class talking about whatever service they provide, it goes in and out until they need it. And once they feel some sort of crisis, they're like, uh-oh, I'm not, maybe not doing as well as I thought. Now it's like, who can help me? And so um, <clears throat> we're part of this process is being aware of how our uh, resources can be uh, better placed so that they're ready for the student when the student is ready for it at, at a smoother way. So the other thing too about this was um, it being different is that this infographic that you have on the back of your sheet here, at the very top here, it lists the goals from AACC's perspective as well about guided pathways. And that's essentially what this is, again, is providing that framework for, that uh, promoting the equity piece, providing aspects about uh, trying to improve the students' chances for competitiveness, for gainful employment, Etc. And so we want to make sure that you also know that when, when we are discussing guided pathways, we are continuing to align and keep in mind with frameworks that are um, very consistent at this point in research that shows that they work. All right, so this wasn't just something that somebody decided to make up. This was all based in research. And the research shows when they pulled students across the country, that students tended to want to know certain things. Uh, when I talk about this in front of academic advisors, for instance, they all nod their heads because this is their life. This is what they hear. And so the first thing they hear out of people's mouths when they walk in and they meet with an academic advisor is, what are my career options? That's, that's the first thing they ask. And if you start looking at advertising of different colleges, um, somebody mentioned um, Grand Canyon in the last session, but I think of Phoenix, or Phoenix, University of Phoenix and places like that, they actually do, if you look at their advertising, their advertising basically answers all of this. It opens with somebody wearing um, nursing scrubs and saying, um, my whole life I had the dream of being a, a nurse and I went to whatever college it is and they told me exactly what classes to take, how much it was gonna cost, what my financial aid needed to be. And they are willing, interestingly enough, to pay more to have that kind of clarity. So we are losing some of our students because we don't necessarily have clarity or what they, what they think of as a clear path. So um, what are my career options is number one. What are the educational paths to, to those careers? So that has to be number two. That's what I want. How do I get to where I want? What will I need to take? And they want this specifically. Um, one of my uh, peer mentors this year was a student from Black Mountain, and when she was meeting with one of, uh, one of the other students in my class, she it, it was very shocked to find out that, that her experience that she had at Black Mountain with a particular person was not the experience that everybody else had. And her experience was she came into that Black Mountain uh, building, and sometimes she knew what she wanted, that, that helped. And that person mapped it all up for her. Here's what you take semester one, semester two, semester three, semester four. And she's like, I walked out of there thinking, I know exactly what I'm going to do, and this is great. And was stunned to find out that most people don't get that. So what they need to take takes so much off their, um, their, uh, their worry list or their burden list. And having people who are able to do that helps them because we also know that students if they don't have clarity, then they try and figure this out however they can. And one of the ways, I've seen this in new student orientation, one of the ways they do this is, well, I'm not exactly sure what to take, so I brought my best friend and he said I should take this. Or they bring their boyfriend or girlfriend who says, well, here's what I took last semester, so why don't you take that? And so
so this kind of this this creates also extra classes that you don't need, more money that is spent, things like that. And students themselves are saying <coughs> that they want more clarity. They also want to know how long it will take and how much it will cost. Makes sense. A lot of our students are um, adults. They have children. They have jobs. They can't um, spend their whole life excuse me, <laughs> trying to figure this stuff out. How much financial aid I can get? That's always one of the first questions. And then will my credits transfer? That's important. So what they generally get, sorry, Bob. Um, are those questions in here? No. Do you want a copy of that? Yes. Okay. If you don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> it's transparency. <laughs> semester, I can't remember what subject area it was. So this is called the cafeteria style. It seems nice in terms of, gosh, it'd be nice if you could figure out what you want it to do, and here's, you've got plenty of options, but plenty of options can also be overwhelming options. And so sometimes a little bit narrower focus is actually, um, I think with younger students especially, or uh, the kind of students we have, you know, first and second year college students, need to tra you know to traverse through this what looks to them like a maze. So that's one of the things with guided pathways as a as a concept also that's talked about especially in the book redesigning America's community colleges is that um, the, this cafeteria model which is the idea of you think old school with your tray in the cafeteria and everything's kind of set there and you just kind of take your tray through and you pick up jello and you pick up pudding and you pick up rice and you pick up something else. And all those things are food, and you might get fed, but it may not necessarily be the thing that's going to be a healthy, balanced meal or get you through your process of taking the right courses in the right categories. And if you're kind of unsure about what your major is, this makes this even more difficult. And the goal, again, is not to recreate and, um, you know, have, have scorched earth, as, as I am put it, but it really is to find out what can we do to streamline the process. So um, if we can help the students to streamline this process, maybe instead of 50 choices, literally 50 choices for a class they can take in a category to meet that category, they might have 10. And that might be an easier choice for them to make instead of having as many. And you start to look at how do we then identify what those courses are based on trends, demands, liberal arts, and having a well-rounded education, the types of things that we want to do to support for our students and, and really developing a strong um, capacity for them to be competitive in the labor market. And so, and this is why it's, that it's going to be so important to have people in each discipline, faculty in each discipline, who are there to guide the student because based on, once they get to know the student, based on what the student needs, they can guide them towards whatever, um, looking at Tommy, art class so that, that um, floats their boat or, you know, things like that. So this kind of, um, where we are guiding them through the process without letting go of them is, is the part that's going to um, improve that relationship and uh, make them feel more committed to this process. And there should be exploratory options as well for students. So it may be that they're not quite sure what they want to do and there will be opportunities for being able to explore that as well. And we want to make sure that we're offering comprehensive set of, of courses for students to be able to do that. And, um, be enriched in their life as well. So. so then we go to returning students. So the first set of questions were new to college students. And, and it's important to remember that new to college students don't even necessarily know the language of college, um, certainly not what its customs are, the things we take for granted, the things we use as shortcuts and acronyms. They're like, what? And so um, I'm just going to tell this again. I, I told it last time, but I was, it was never so clear to me how raw uh, a student can come, <clears throat> um, but I know that now, based on a young man who was from a very cold city in the Midwest, who because of family issues was sent out here to live with his mom. 
And she said, well, you're not just going to live out here and play video games and live in my basement. You either you need to go to college. And so she sends him off here. He had no idea, no one that he knew in his life, no one in his family, no one in his where he grew up, had ever been college students. So there was nothing in him that this was familiar. This was like dropping him onto a strange planet, you know, strange language, everything. And so advising did the correct thing. They said, uh, let's not go full time, let's go half time. And they set him up with two classes. And meanwhile, I get the call, because I was the early alert person at the time, saying, I've got this student who um, uh, has high absentee rates and isn't coming very often and has missed half the classes this semester. So when he comes in, and I said, so tell me what's going on. And, and uh, opening that conversation, well, it turns out he understood that when the advisor said, oh, we're only going to have you go half time, that meant he went half of the time. So his Monday Wednesday class that met twice a week, he would go to either Monday or Wednesday. And first, I mean, first I just thought, you know, can't that can't. And but that was it. And so since that time, um, if we can't assume that students, my students quite often don't know what credits are. Say, do you know what a credit is? And they'll be like, I don't know. So this is so this assumption that they come in knowing this system is a faulty one. And even our students who are returning students, they come in and well, we all like them. You know, our, our, our adult reentry students, they're a wonderful student because they don't waste, they don't waste time and money. And so the first thing they ask is, how far along am I in this program? So my fondest wish is for our e-tool that is hopefully going to be a part of this process is that students can always check and see, here's, here's how you get from A to B and here's where you are on this continuum and this is how many more classes you're going to need. And so um, they also want to know if they're on schedule. We all know these, these students. They, they don't want to have their time wasted. And I get that. How much more will I have to pay? This matters. They're adults and they're working and they have families. And they're taking time away from their families and their jobs to be here. What will I need to take next term and how will my schedule be? block out their job um, schedule, all these kind of things. These are very important questions. What if I want to change programs? So again, if you are on a MAP, it doesn't mean you're married to the MAP till the end of time. It does mean you can step off that MAP and go to a different MAP. There's always going to be people there who can help you through that process. And then um, how can I get work experience in my field? It's amazing to me, you know, we have um, a career services here that does a wonderful job with internships. And so they don't know what they don't know. So as long as everybody's aware in, on the academic side of the student affairs side that we have a person who is very good at helping students find internships, then we can start helping them find these answers that they want. And so as Barron's talking and summarizing between the new students and returning students, one of the things that comes up that we all need to um, have an uh, impact, influence, uh, interest in is helping students to make the connection between their academic goals and their career goals. <coughs> and that's the theme that you see in what they're asking from a um, perspective of being a new student as well as a perspective of being a returning student. And in our daily work, it's important for us to ask ourselves, how do we help students to make those connections between what it is that they want to do academically and what they want to do in terms of possibly a career or some other personal development goal? You know, it was interesting to me that I had, I don't know, six or eight of my students come to Forum One and have one at each table. And this was filled with mostly division chairs and then other faculty and then people from student affairs. And because um, I wanted that student perspective be heard, and I wanted their input later on what they thought. And the interesting thing was at the end of the semester, I forgot to tell you this, um, was on the last day, at least four of them came up to me and said, when, so when are you guys going to start this guided pathways thing, or, or is it going to take a long time and I'm just going to miss it, because it really sounded good. And a lot of them wanted to use it now, because it made sense to them. <coughs> So, uh, and that gets into 
talking about what, how do we utilize this information, co connecting students to the academic and career goals that they might have in mind, and understanding the experience from the recruitment phase all the way through to graduation, and then our students become an alumni or participating somehow on our campus as they continue to thrive in the community. So it's important to have that understanding, and one of the things that we, we did with the first two forums was we looked at things as it related to each one of these areas. You know, from the connection phase, what kind of things do we do to market to our students, to let them know the value proposition of a community college, to get them to actually come onto our campus? How do we let them know what we offer, and that that's going to be something that they want in their life? Then entry, how do we continue to engage that student? Uh, and, and as you can see, I'll, I'll come back to talking about each one, but the, first, the top one above is related again to research that, that looks at the student life cycle. And um, the Maricopa has adopted the Lost Momentum Framework as a part of that research with connection, entry, progress, and completion. And then as a system, added in transition as part of that process. And I put underneath that our Puma pathway because it very much aligns with each one of those five areas from beginning to end. So how do we prepare students? How do we engage them? How do we recruit them and give them a value proposition for community colleges to let them know that they are at the right college, that PBCC is the college of choice for them, right? Then how do we engage them? How do we onboard them? How do we help them learn about the enrollment process? How do we help them know that this is a welcoming place here and that they belong here? And that they want to be engaged with just about anyone on our campus and that they feel like they have touchstones and people that they can go to points of contact. Then commit. How do we help the students to make that decision about what it is that they want to do, the major that they choose, the path that they may decide that they want to pursue, and what that's going to mean for their future? And then how do we help them to complete? Once they get about 75% of the way through, sometimes life still continues to happen as part of that process. Or maybe there are other experiences like internships, et cetera, that they want to be able to have. How do we continue to engage with our students in a way that also helps them to know that we are living our mission of positive social change and holistic student development, right? And then how do we help them to thrive? They become students uh, that are alumni here. They might have their grandchildren, their parents, their friends come and take a class because they had such a good experience here. Or they may come and engage in our um, events and activities as well. So how do we continue to even stay connected to our students and our community? So this has multiple ways in which you can look at this as well because this cycle can be something that you look at overarching from the beginning of the student college experience to the end. But even as a faculty member, the student may go through this, this process in the, the scope of a semester of being in your class, right? Because they come into your class, you're preparing them, you're engaging them in the process of what the expectations are. You are actually getting them to commit to doing their homework and assignments and studying, et cetera, right? Hopefully they complete your class, they're retained, they have a successful um, retention rate, and then you're helping them to thrive so they may be set up with either foundations for the next course that they have to take to be successful in that, or that they're enriched in some way and got um, what they wanted to get out of the class. So this can ha happen at a micro level in terms of conceptually looking at the student experience, and also at the macro level overall, what is the student college experience. So that's why we have you organized in these five different categories. So that as you're thinking about the context of what Guided Pathways is, the definition from the elevator speech, those four areas of implementation that um, help them to clarify a path, get on a path, stay on a path, and ensure that they're learning. And then being able to see what is it at each phase of the student experience can have an impact on them. So the first two, um, forums that we did, we focused on opportunities and barriers. So we started with barriers based on context, so that's what this first handout is, an outline, where it says barriers, is we asked everyone in the different categories of the student life cycle to start to look at what are some of the things that surface here that seem like they're really important to prioritize. Then we asked about opportunities. What kinds of things are opportunities, positive things that we could look forward to if we were to implement guided pathways? 
And what were the themes related to that at each phase of the student life cycle? So what we're going to ask you to do is start with these two documents at your table and focus only on the particular area of emphasis at your table for right now. You get to take these home so you'll have all this information. But we want to be able to kind of spread the wealth, right? So um, at each table, you'll have a, a handout that looks like this. Wherever you see the pronounced square, that's the theme that you're focused on. So when you look at your handout, for instance, for this one, it's connection and prepare. So the first page at the top says connection and prepare. So you know that that's the feedback that, that we receive from the first form, okay? Related to connection and compare, prepare. So what you're looking to do also is look at the barriers and the opportunities and the themes that came about as a result of that particular, um, each of those forums. And then the goal would be to, from that, prioritize what you think might be good to focus on. If we were going to identify solutions that are related to those themes. And if we were to identify solutions, what kinds of suggestions could you all make, right, that we would want to start looking at and consider and make sure that we are um, communicating about as ways as PDCC can kind of move forward in the implementation process of guided pathways. So we're first going to give you a chance to digest a little bit of what's in this, in these two um, outlines, and then as you start to identify themes, you could look at similarities, you could look at differences, you could look at what you think is most important that stands out to you. If something is missing, or you think, ah, oh, this is this hasn't been communicated, we want to know about that as well. So I want you to start there and have that discussion at your table, and then once you've identified what you think maybe some of the priorities are that come to surface from these two documents, then we want you to talk about ways in which you would recommend solutions to be able to address those if we were to implement, which we are, guided pathways, right? So that's kind of where we're starting, and um, we'll, we'll kind of come around and mill around to the table so that if you have questions, we can answer any questions that you have and provide any clarity that you might need as we continue with this framework. This afternoon, about an hour ago, I was walking in from my car. There was a family, a mother, father, and um, kid walking in, walked right by here, walked right by the this main door right here, kept going, and I said, can I help you? And they looked at me and they go, where's the main entrance? Mm -hmm. And they were continuing to walk down to the hallway where you go into counseling. And so I showed them where the main entrance was. Um, so it's not obvious. Yes, you've got that huge sign up there, but when you're on the ground in the parking lot, you don't see that. So one of the things that we talked about is improving the actual building layout externally, making uh, it very obvious where the main entrance is, and then when you walk in the main entrance, really losing the DMV feel that is just hit you in the face when you get in there. Um, and then having some kind of a main entrance where uh, it, uh, there's flowers, there's welcoming, there's, in, there's, there's soft chairs. Somebody talks to you, somebody um, is glad that you came on campus and asked what brings you here and then gives you a sense of confidence that they're gonna channel you to the appropriate staff member to help you for why you're there that day. Um, then we talked about very likely, we need to hire more academic advisors because the person that really most people would see, they get channeled to by this welcoming individual is an academic advisor. And with our current academic advisors, they don't have very much time, and I've heard stories that they're given a sheet of paper, this is basically we believe in self-empowerment, here's basically what you need to do, you can go sit at that computer, you can get enrolled, and you take these classes, or you go and you take this test. And they're not sitting down, they're not really trying to get that person, why that person is here, and spending some time with that person, and yeah, we need more academic advisors. They may have to get an initial feel for why that person's here. They may need to take a placement test, and they have to come back again. 
but it'd be really nice if they could even come back to the same person. I mean, then they start to feel like there's a, somebody here, they know me, I don't have to tell my story all over again, and they get launched, and they feel good about this college. So that's all, <laughs> that's really all we got to, and um, we thought, we need more money. <laughs> I would just I say, I would just, I would just add that people. when we talked about the environment that it needs to be, uh, the students are our customers and we need to create an environment that's inviting for an 18 year old, not somebody that's 60. And so some kind of environment where we also need to do it in a timely manner that we realize that like right now, if you want to see an advisor, you're probably waiting an hour, and an average 18 year old is not gonna wait five minutes for anything. So things need to be done in an expeditiously way and get it done quick, quicker. I don't, I don't, don't you know, we can tell them that they should have patience, but they don't. And I really believe that somehow doing things quicker and is gonna help our ultimately our customer, our students, uh, be happy. Thank you. Give them a hand. Uh, we had engaged and the things that we saw that were early modern English, I, I majored in Shakespeare. Anyway, um, <laughs> I was dared, I took them up. The themes that we saw between our two areas in the comments was one is the dissemination of information for students or people who want to be students who come here. We give them too much at once. We cram it all together and it's just overwhelming because a lot of times they don't even know what we're talking about. So maybe some kind of open house, some kind of subdivision so they're getting more timely information when it means something to them, when we have the time to explain what these things mean. Um, placement, the placement tests were uh, a big deal um, because they don't understand the importance and the impact. If we could actually explain that to them um, and make sure that they come back. Because if you've just spent a couple of hours trying to get things done and get enrolled and do, you're not ready to take a test that's going to decide what classes you're taking. And students tend not to understand that because they place where they don't want to be and they wait their two days and they come back. They're still not ready. So helping them understand either through boot camps or some kind of prep. Um, also, I got this out of UDL, um, the idea that faculty does have the ability to move students up and down if they're right at the edge of something and, well, no, they, they're going to be bored in this class, we can move them up. Our adjuncts don't always know this, and I'm getting this from people I talked to, I'll give you names if you want names. <laughs> um, but helping the adjuncts especially, but helping the faculty understand, you know, if this student just missed one or two things about, you know, punctuated wrong, on a placement test, they don't need to be in the 09 English. They can go into 101. We can help them learn that. Um, but helping the faculty know and um, developing some rubrics, because we like to have reasons for doing things that can help guide our faculty in knowing, no, this student really isn't ready for this class. I'm going to recommend, not force, but recommend that the student consider going down. And those kind of internal things are done on an unofficial level, but maybe be a little more official, um, just to help place our students more accurately. And then advising, and this is not beating up advisors, because we have, what, one advisor for every 1,500 students. They're amazing. That they come back to work each day <laughs> is amazing. We need more of them. I mean, this is such an important part of what we do. We need more of them. We need more consistency in messaging. I think a lot of us have heard, well, I went in one time and was told I needed this, and the next time they said, no, I need that. So we need more consistency. Um, some faculty training to help guide students through their majors, not to, you know, it's like, okay, Tommy, I'm, I'm gonna major in math, please help me. 
you know, that's not fair. But within their majors as the students advance, uh, make sure that the faculty have the information they need to help the students. That also takes some pressure off the advisors. Um, and then, you know, like we're open after the Welcome Center is closed. We can, you know, we can help with basic advising, just very basic. So kind of like a, a, a school-wide training. What are the very basics of advising that everybody on this campus should be able to help students with? Thank you, Mary. <laughs> when we talked about completion, we were focused on nursing because we both have issues uh, with students current, current. We recently had a couple of students that were struggling with completion, and so we focused on that. And it could translate into any program. So, so we looked at uh, some solutions for nursing, for example, to have bridge programs for students to help complete. So if a student did not pass their tests, they, we would have bridge programs so they could get back into the program. So for example, we have paramedic to RN, LPN to RN. And then we also have this one program called CEP, which is an AAS so, uh, to MSN. So if a student has a previous bachelor's degree, they can come to PPCC and get an AAS degree and then go on and get their master's. And we have that program with uh, GCU right now. So, so that's part of completion, right? To help students complete their nursing degree. Okay, this one's already in place right now. So we got a lot of students right now who are already in the paramedic to RN. In fact, last semester we had that bridge course and we already have 15 students out of that who are now getting processed into the nursing program itself, okay? And then we have the LPN, we call them the advanced placement students. This one here, the CEP, or the concurrent enrollment program, are students who basically have previous bachelor's degree on any discipline, and then they get evaluated, and they could get into the nursing program by taking, of course, some of the bridge courses, and they could get into the AAS to MSN through our Grand Canyon University, okay? The, the whole idea here is from entry to the nursing program to really probably plan on what do they wanna be when they grow up, when they become nurses. So do they wanna continue with a higher degree, be nurse practitioners or however they want it to be, okay? So this one's already in place, but these are the ones that we really are encountering a lot right now, and that is what you were. <laughs> so really, so, but these are good examples to show you that not everybody knows their exact path. So if they don't know their exact path, they may we may need, in any program, need to develop some bridge courses, and also, so for students who already went out and got a degree and they decided to change their major, we, we can adjust also. So these are really good examples that way, that, that not everybody has to know their path at 18. You know, they change. So, but some barriers that we know that some students have been exited due to multiple failures. So yeah, so if their lifetime dream was, I, I knew I wanted to be a nurse, but they're not making it. They're not passing the, the exam. So, so they fail, so then we ha they have an option to take their CNA or LPN, get some experience, and then go back and get their RN. So we know that if a student has that dream, we don't want to uh, deflate their dream, but help them you know, take a detour, in other words, to get to their dream. And that's not only gonna happen in one uh, area, it could be engineering, it could be math or whatever, but we have to be able to be flexible with completion. There's not only one road to Rome. There, there's, there's gonna be detours. But one of the things we found in talking about this is sometimes uh, students come with credits from a different private university or whatever, maybe, uh, uh, and we need to better assess those credits and find out if they're comparable to our credits and really take a good look at, at are they gonna make it here, for example, in nursing. You know, so um, then we need to offer specialized test taking skills, uh, especially with critical thinking for the nursing students because they need a lot of the critical thinking. There, maybe we could partner with uh, with the uh, tutoring center. We could, you know, to really help them with We're that. In. So think about that specialized test taking. 
We also need to do better referrals for psych testing. We have students who have been in the military or have had lifelong trauma and offer some psych testing so that they do get the accommodations early. We had a student who had accommodation late and if maybe he had had those accommodations early, he wouldn't have been exited from the completion. So if we have that, if we're able to identify that a lot earlier for students, they can, they can meet that. And some students, I know for those referrals for psych testing, they don't have the money. So maybe we can write some kind of grant or whatever for students who do need to go off campus and get that psych testing so that they can get the accommodations that they need to complete. So if they're not getting those accommodations, that's a problem, you know, because they don't have the money. It's like, you know, right now with our healthcare system. And then we need to do more intrusive advisement, early intrusive advisement. If they're not doing well, really give them some, some options there and maybe offer some more career exploration uh, courses for those students. Maybe have, uh, you know, some mini workshops that way as well. So we do want our students to complete. We know that there's not a straight road. You know, we know that there's going to be bumps in the road, but we need to offer some, some, um, you know, a soft landing and places for them to go and get help to complete and to, to reach their dreams and goals or to give them other alternatives. Uh, I need to add something. In terms of these students who have been exited, they could be coming back to us on the entry level of LPN or CNA. The question now is, they may be able to complete the degree, but the question now is to the next phase, which is the transition. Would they be able to pass the NCLEX, which is the national licensing? Because again, they could be already memorized everything and then be able to pass the whole blocks. But the question now is, how are they going to pass the NCLEX exam? We have students right now who's been taking exam two or three times already and could not pass the national licensing. So are we really producing somebody who will be a survival out there to be transitioned into the new And career. do you want them to be your nurse? Exactly. <laughs> That's the big question. So, and the other part is, again, part of this will be the intrusive advisement. Majority of the students don't like to be told that the nursing may not be the option for you. So you may want to consider, so how do you be, how can you be direct with them and let them know that? Yeah, and Kathy, thank you. Any questions? Kind of what we, we have sort of mirrors a lot what some of the other groups were saying. <clears throat> um, we thought first off um, for helping students know where they're going, better, clearer advising uh, earlier in their life cycle can kind of reduce the anxiety that new students feel, and everyone has kind of mentioned that already. And again, maybe it comes from many more advisors than we, than we already have and, and specializing and spending a little more time with the students that way. So that first step, they're more comfortable uh, when, when they set foot here at PBCC knowing what they're doing. Because as somebody already mentioned, it's kind of the first faces they see are, are advisors. And so again, kind of rather than that DMV mentality, make it more personal uh, of a connection that, that they have. So when they leave here after that advising meeting, they feel a little bit more secure. I mean, college is always going to be intimidating. We all know that. We all went. And if they can have that first experience a little more reassuring, then it's not going to be quite so intimidating when they got to go then to the bookstore and and uh, get a parking permit and then you know, end up in, in, in class first day and get bombarded by syllabi and, and things like that. Uh, in terms of transfer credits, um, we think that there needs to be a better liaison with the institutions that the students want to transfer to. And I know we've all had experiences, probably most commonly with ASU, that it's not always very clear as to what they will take on any given day sometimes. And uh, requirements seem to change. And, and uh, again, that's you know, something on, on our end, maybe kind of hold at least the tri universities feet to the fire a little bit better in terms of helping them to understand that if, if we send them a happier customer, they get a happier and better customer too. Because uh, I know I've had students come back to me, though I mean teach humanities, but I've had students come in a panic because they're now at ASU and they say, okay, they won't accept introduction to cinema, which it says it doesn't. I said, no, they have to accept it. Here's the syllabus. They're just, I want you to take it there for their tuition. 
So, you know, there needs to be uh, a little bit better connection that way. And but part of that's got to be, too, that the universities have to understand that we're not necessarily competing with them, but we're preparing good, qualified students so that they can thrive at ASU, U of A, or, or, or NAU. And we need to, uh, to get them on board to think better with that, that partnership, too. So we're not maybe fighting each other so much, but working a little bit a little closer together. Uh, in, in terms then of uh, how much do I pay, when is it owe, again, kind of similar to uh, the advising, uh, a little bit more financial aid advising, a little bit better, more clear, and again, it's probably going to come from additional staffing, but it's a big issue. Uh, money's always going to be a number one issue, even at community colleges, you know, it's not have the exorbitant tuition, but money is still money, and everybody works hard for their money. And so this too has to be a reassuring step, so they don't become intimidated, they're not scared away from when they come on, on onto campus here. Um, we're kind of just mingling and talking here and lamenting the old days where everything was right there when you walked in. You had cashiers, financial aid, you had advising, registration. Uh, so you know, maybe too, just the physical layout of, of, of how we introduce students to the campus into this, uh, this first process might help alleviate some of the, the concerns that students are having. Uh, in terms of, of, of career placement, uh, what jobs and, and, and such are going to be available afterwards, again, uh, get a strong relationship between our career center, job center, uh, and advising, and, and the different departments too, uh, so that we work sort of in, in congruence with one another. Now we have some job fairs, maybe more of those. Um, maybe there is an advising component. Again, I, I mean, if I'm being unfair here, I mean, I teach humanities, so we don't, we don't have to be humanities employers. Uh, but, but, you know, maybe in the business division or in the sciences, and maybe I already do this, I don't know. I mean, I, I might be ignorant. But uh, connection between faculty, the job center, and even employers where they can begin to make some connections for possible internships or jobs, or at least. Uh, a, a connection, know where to go. At least you know, here's your okay, here's your next step. Uh, and then our final one: uh, skill development versus academic intellectual knowledge. Liberal arts emphasis encourages an engagement with lifelong learning opportunities. And uh, uh, Tommy and I come from the arts and the humanities, so we're a little bit prejudiced on on, on this one. <laughs> but we both laughed because. I was telling her I, I graduated my bachelor's degree with 180 credits because <laughs> I just love learning. And she said, yeah, I mean, she was about, about pretty close. <laughs> um, and that might be a little ridiculous and then maybe in this day and age, you know, I mean, college was cheap back then. Um, but we want to in, in, instill in them the idea that it's not just, this is not just another checkbox that you go off to college. You, you really are here to learn something. And, I, I, and that's a challenge in the humanities, because once in a while I say, well, why don't I humanities class? I said, because it's going to make you a better human being. And it's going to make you more interesting at cocktail parties. <laughs> but more than that, though, it really will make you a better person. I was just clean out my office, which I, I do every 10 years. And I was going through uh, some student assessments, the courses, and was for uh, one of my women in film classes. And the, the student had written, this class has made me want to get involved in women's rights. I'm going to go volunteer now at a, at a, a shelter for women. And it was just like a movie class on uh, women's film. And, and it may not be her career, it probably won't be, but it sparked something in her. And ultimately that's what we're here for, is to spark something in our students, whether it's, 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 to, it's to come up with a new theory of physics or whether it, it, it's to read more Shakespeare and go see a Shakespearean play. But, you know, ultimately, uh, we focus on the liberal arts. We, we get well-rounded, better human beings that come out of here, and ultimately, that makes for a better society. Thank that you is ours. So, so this, I just want to continue to remind you that this is a living, breathing document. This FAQ document was sent to the chairs at, the, at each um, college of the college implementation teams as a document from the business leads to help us with some sense making around the structure, the organizational structure and the framework. So this chart right here, you might have remembered, uh, uh, even these titles, I believe you won't have remembered this, but the titles even may have be changing with the structure that's listed here. You have received an email from the Chancellor's Office uh, regarding TIP, the Transformation Integrated Framework. 
that's kind of this overarching uh, group that is also going to be the, 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 the recommending body to CEC for a lot of what's going to be happening with guided pathways. So at the top in that gray box area, it says Transformation Steering Committee. Essentially that is the tenth um, group right there. Then underneath that where it's green, you start to see that's where the steering uh, committee would be. So that's all the different chairs at the different colleges for the college implementation teams. It, we all meet, um, we were meeting uh, about bi-monthly. Now that, that's kind of tapered off a little bit, but we still meet and that's where the work teams are going to be happening and be formed. So we're already starting to develop those work teams at the steering team level and we're starting to identify with those work teams what categories we're gonna focus on in those work teams and what subject matter experts still need to be recruited to participate in those work teams in terms of faculty and staff. So this gives you information about the different categories of those work teams. For each one of the work teams, there will be scope documents that are identified to give you a scope of the work that each of the work teams will be focused on and how that relates to different areas of the guided pathways uh, transformation. So that's what this particular chart is about. Um, after that, you start to see information about uh, the membership of uh, the different committees as it relates to the transformation and guided pathways, so I won't go over that as much. There's also a diagram here that talks a little bit about the decision-making process. So um, in the first part where it says business leads and subject matter experts will write the scope documents that are a part of the projects for the different work teams. Those will be vetted in the, in, uh, Diana mentioned cross-functional teams. These, these work teams are cross-functional teams. So it's important to be aware of that. that. The goal is to try to get as much representation as possible for all of the different uh, important stakeholder groups that may be impacted by some of these decisions. Then uh, the integration team then views the scopes and reviews them, and then it goes um, to the recommending of the, that TIP, TIP committee. And that TIP committee then reviews those documents and makes recommendations for approval to CEC. So that is an understanding of, at this point in time, the decision-making process for this and to be aware that we want to continue to make sure that we're having transparent co communication with you and also that this is a living, breathing document, okay? So the other components that are listed here are related to the dates for the institutes. We talked about this a little bit in our last communication. So we, the district has um, hired consultants that are going to be, uh, that have already been really involved in helping us with this transformation process. They're experts in the field and to help early adopter colleges across the nation with this process of uh, transitioning into a guided pathways model. And so um, these are the institutes that the college implementation teams are going to be going to. So these are by invitation only. Um, there are only about 150 spots available at each one of these institutes over the next two years and that is comprised of each of the college implementation teams and the college president, and then there's a district team that also will be there. And there'll be six colleges identified to host each one of the institutes. TV is on here, but not until next year. And the first institute is early February at Stray Mountain Community College. So that also is gonna give us context over those two days about things that we need to know uh, about guided pathways, what are the best practices, and also our consultants will be there. So the next page gives you information about um, the, <coughs> the site visits. So each one of the colleges will have a consultant that will come and visit uh, subsequently to the institute to help with the information that we're getting as guides to help us through this process. So uh, as a college implementation team, one of the things that we were charged to do at each one of the colleges is some pre-work to really determine what it is that it, each institution we're already currently doing that's in alignment with the guided pathways framework and, um, and uh, model. So we submitted that information to our consultants and they will be reviewing that. And then they'll look at that overarching as a system, but also at each of the individual colleges and our consultant will be working
working with us to be able to help us through this implementation process over the next two years, okay? So that's what the dates are that are listed there. And then the last thing that we wanted to share with you was related to that there is actually a district-wide website for transformation. So the link is there on that next page, and Diane's gonna talk a little bit about the website. We've been asked to funnel our information to one place so that it's easier for us as a system to be able to know what it is that we're doing with Guided Pathways and the transformation, and that all of our um, information there is a repository that we can um, refer to. So I wanna give the answer next talk. Okay, so this will be the two minute, really quickly guided tour. Um, and in the spirit of transparency, I think this is an excellent idea that the district decided to create something like this. So if you just click on this, and if you, if you enter it once, just say it's favorites, and then you can just check in periodically to see what's going on. So there are multiple places that you can go to here, but there's a couple I wanted to just show you that I thought were particularly good. Um, you can click on Guided Pathways itself here, and it will show you the four keys to Guided Pathways. And there's things under each of these, obviously. And then um, there's one for industry partnerships and enterprise performance. So you can check in with things as they are loaded to this area and then um, so check out all of these things this is just what i just talked about it's just another way to get to guided pathways and industry and enterprise but i thought resources was kind of interesting so keep this one in mind and uh, you can see what the chancellor's vision is you, this is something that's been embraced and you know, promoted by the chancellor uh, this is they, they with her and, um, but there's a couple ones that I thought were particularly interesting when I looked at them. One was the advising model and the other was meta majors. And so by clicking on those, you can see when this information was uh, uh, put together and then um, who was involved in it. There's a table of contents, but it's just interesting to see this in a written form at the moment of who, what the, who the business drivers are, what the goals are, what the assumptions are, what the scope is for academic advising, and the same thing for meta majors, because that seems to be a thing people get stuck, are most concerned about this part of it in terms of what people are telling me. So for right now, and, and I can't remember if I said it in here in this session, but this process is so ground level right now. So this is, you're going to see this as it, as it eventually builds into what it's going to end up being. But again, it looks at the same table of contents, but now based on or talking about how that applies to meta majors. So um, it's time, we're out of time, but that is um, the website that will be available to you all the time. So those scope documents, when we talked about those project work teams, these scope documents are driving the work of those project work teams. So you'll have access to them as they get approved to be able to look at here at this website. The other thing too, just to, um, in closing, that, that student life cycle that we're looking at, you can see the district's uh, adoption of the law momentum framework very much aligns with our PUMA pathway. So my goal also is to create a, a PUMA pathway website that we can utilize here and find some connections to how that also is going to have an impact on the guided pathways transformation that we're working on. But we don't wanna make sure that, that folks know about this particular website because this is going to be the driver for all things transformation. And, and hopefully the Puma Pathway website that we create at the college level just helps you to be able to understand how we implement these things in our daily work and understanding the context. Okay. So um, hopefully uh, you were informed a little bit. Hopefully you got some things that you can take with you. Thank you for all of your contributions to today and we will continue to have these types of um, events, activities to continue to grapple with this. We hope that you will share these, uh, what, what you know with students and with other you know, colleagues and coworkers and employees. Uh, thank you again for your time. Happy New Year, happy Monday, and welcome back. Thank you. Everybody.